late at night, depending on where you are in the world. <clears throat> Today we're going to be talking about some supplements. Jesus is going to be telling us about NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. But before we get started on that, we've got a few other things to, uh, to talk about. Jesus, you want to get us started? Sure. And uh, thank you, everyone, who is watching the show today. I hope you're doing really well. Uh, I bet just a few people will say they're, they're doing as well as Dr. Brew right now. I don't know if you want to... Do you want to start with your uh, tourist advertisement just yet? Or, <laughs> <laughs> or should I hold on, on that? It was my birthday yesterday. So yeah. as you'll see, I, I took a vacation. I'm back down in the... Uh, at the beach at Kiowa Island in South Carolina. My niece did not want me to mention Kiowa because it's becoming so popular. And you can see why. Some of the best golf courses in the world. The Ryder Cup has been played here multiple times. Senior PGA, PGA Championship. And I don't play that course that much. My golf game is really bad. But they've got other courses here that are fun. And what I do is I get on, I rent a bicycle and we rent, we went about 20 miles yesterday all over the beach in everywhere. So I'm having a blast while Jesus is having to work. <laughs> but I did make it back for the show. Uh, yeah. But I mean, uh, when you like your work, it's, it doesn't seem like it. So. That's good. I'm going to Guanajuato this weekend, probably. So just so you, just so you know, I don't have it as bad as you might think. <laughs> All right. So let, let's let's get started then. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about high triglycerides, plug reversal using supplements and brand new, well, compared to others, brand new supplement that's kind of more popular in Asia than in the US. <clears throat> uh, some interesting research that we have for you. The short topic is not glycemic index. We covered that last week. For some reason, I thought I changed that, and it's not reflecting in here. We're going to talk about NAD, just like Dr. Dr. Brewer said. And uh, we have a couple of other topics. If you're new to the channel, you're very welcome. Uh, the things that you will see right here on this channel every Wednesday are topics related to cardiovascular prevention, de de detecting diabetes, pre-diabetes, uh, and insulin resistance, the main root cause of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and stroke. Um, we discussed last week how there's a study over there that claims that statin therapy might increase LP little a and therefore increase cardiovascular risk. Uh, the authors of that study will not be too happy with us, but this is what we do. We are kind of critical with some of the research that we see. And sometimes research is not as... as um, as correct as you might think. Who was the guy who mentioned about that? I know I have it on my mind, but I, I'm not able to Yanitas. pronounce his name. Yeah. Yanitas. Isn't I've, I've it been, John it, I think it's John. He published an article on the uh, public, la, public Library of Science about how most, uh, most research might be flawed or be a lie. And I, and I think it's just mainly because of the poor design and the high amount of bias that you will find in some research. But that's an interesting topic. If you're interested in that, we're we're not we're not study, study haters, not at all. But <laughs> it's important it's important to to mention when it, when a study is is going to be useful and when when it might not be. Uh, we also discuss high intensity interval training and heart disease prevention and how uh, the type of intensity, the amount of intensity that you put on a workout might be more important than the volume of the workout itself. And head training might not be the same as resistance training. And there's a place for both types of exercise, even for aerobics exercise. It, there's a place for that. And you have to find what your goal is in order to uh, select the right type of exercise and when to do it. We discussed that. And um, three or four weeks ago, we discussed Dr. Brewer's CGM results. He was sharing with us the type of uh, what he calls filing off the wagon from time to time and how that looks like on a CGM. Uh, you were you were enjoying that ice cream on those days as well, right? Oh no! Who told you? You told me. <laughs> we put that on the slide. Also, uh, no. no but, but I'm not talking about yesterday. I'm talking about 
weeks so weeks ago. I think I've I, already shared my uh, sweets addiction, especially ice cream addiction. So, mm-hmm. yeah, we did it again on my birthday. I had I had a salad and nuts, uh, really good all day until after dinner, and then I had some gelato. Did did you did you try your glucose after that? No, I didn't. No, test you, you didn't, <laughs> you no, didn't want to see. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's what we discuss. It's it's not like uh, what what some people might feel like it. Like they have to avoid sugars a lot at all costs. Not every single time or not one time. And I mean, life is life. And when you have that opportunity, I mean, if you can have an ice cream on your birthday, what what are we here for, right? <laughs> So that's okay. And uh, then you come back to do some heat training and go back to exercise and go back to your usual lifestyle. And that's life saving. And f- yeah, yeah, interesting thing. <laughs> I'm, as you know, uh, I haven't talked about it much on the channel, but I've talked about it on, um, on Twitter and uh, Instagram and some of the shorts that I'm doing a trial of the device called Lumen. I'll have to go get it and show it to you. And it's so interesting because it, it, what it does is it measures the carbon in your exhale. And the reason that it does that is it's estimating how much, what, what your fuel mix is, how much it's carbon versus, I mean, uh, carbohydrates versus fats. And what is very interesting is, despite the fact that I've been low carb, despite some, you know, eating some cantaloupe and a little bit of watermelon and taking some, uh, some vacation, food, carb vacations, I, I still remain like 100 grams of carbs for the most part. And it keeps saying I'm, I'm burning carbs on a scale of one to five where one is uh, burning fats and five is burning carbs. I was like four, three, four, and five, almost always. I hit, I hit two twice over about a four week, three or four week period so far. And I'm getting frustrated with the device because I just don't think that I'm that carb driven. Now, uh, as you know, one of our other team members is trying it as well. She's much younger than I am. She's in her thirties, I think. And she came out of the blocks hitting ones and twos. And I'm part of me is wondering, is it because it's, um, uh, because I'm essentially diabetic, you know, I've shared that on the channel multiple times as well. And one of the questions is there's some complicating factors to it. And pardon me for going down this bunny hole, but it's, I think it's a worthwhile bunny hole. That's an interesting device. If it actually uh, produces or, or the service that it that it's, says it does, and it's, it's a lot of opportunity for those of us in, in this world, this low-carb, insulin-resistant world. So <clears throat> one of the... One of the times, so I train really hard, like with, um, I can, I'll do like hill intervals where I get up to 150 uh, pulse rate. And sometimes I do that having had few, if any carbs all day, and still I'll come out at a four or five. And the point that they made is it might be because you're burning glycogen. And so stop, give it a 20 minute rest, maybe even eat something. And so here's the interesting point, you know, pardon me for going down that bunny hole. But so last night for my birthday dinner, I ended up having a big old salad. And there was a wonderful gelato place under uh, underneath the restaurant. And we went down there and had gelato this morning for the first time ever. I hit a one. Pure fat burn. Huh. Does that make it's like it, it doesn't make any sense. The, the device is measuring carbon dioxide, isn't it? I I don't know. It's a good question. I've looked it up in the past and it was like <clears throat> I thought 
I thought they said they were measuring the amount of carbon, but maybe they're saying carbon dioxide. Because, well, I mean, it, it makes sense in a general and broad idea to think that if you are burning glucose and oxygen, you're going into uh, aerobic metabolism, which produces both ATP energy and carbon dioxide. However, I will argue, I mean, I, I'm not familiar with the device. And you and I know that we're not kind of married to the brand. Uh, we there there's there's some people that are promoting it, like Jason Fung and other folks. If you go to the website, um, but I'm 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 not sure. Still, I mean, I I was waiting on your perspective on it because carbon dioxide might be impacted by other stuff. So if they're measuring volume, concentration, pressure of carbon dioxide, that makes a lot of that makes a point of to discuss what's the science behind it. Yeah. So, um, pardon me, I had a distraction when you were talking about that. So basically you're getting more carbon dioxide, you're burning more carbon dioxide with carbohydrates. Is that well, what the... that's the general idea, but with anaerobic metabolism, you might have that as well. Maybe not as much as with aerobic exercise, but you do. Yeah. Well, we'll we will uh, we'll continue to push on this issue and um, and see how it comes out. It's a yep. very interesting problem, and again, it's very uh, exciting to uh, to think about having yep. that kind of of uh, gauge to just know what we're burning. Yep. Yeah, and and of course those glycogen and even. We, there, there's a process on the liver that folks might know already that's called gluconeogenesis that is basically your body creating new glucose to make up for all that glucose that you might not have on your intake and that varies from people to people some people have an increase on that part of the, your metabolism where you are creating your own glucose and you might see that i don't know if that's your case um it's gonna, well, that, it's, it's interesting to that's see. obviously the uh, the picture that I'm creating with this with the little story that I told. And it's like, if that's the case, how does this thing, you know, it, they do make the point. It takes them at least two weeks to learn your metabolism. Hmm. And well, maybe that's what's going on. Maybe it's finally beginning to realize that I make a whole lot of my own glucose and therefore it has to ratchet back to understand uh, what I'm burning. Yep. Well, it, that's interesting. It's it going to be interesting to see long, long term results. And of course, we're very likely to cover that with the specifics on the science behind it. Yep. I will be quiet for a minute and let you introduce our content in the show. Well, we, we kind of made a clean up for, from, from our slides, as you know. We, we had a. We, Dr. Burr says that at least on the show, I might have uh, be thirst of power, but it's not the case. We have another folk on the team that is very more likely uh, directing the things that we put on social media. And he's, doing a, he's doing a great job on it. And he suggested we clean up our slides a little bit. So you're going to see way less infomercial type of slides over here. We know about the book. We know about a lot of, a lot of stuff that Dr. Burr has, has done and we might go back to that at some point, but right now we're going to focus on two things. One, if you are a Medicare beneficiary, traditional Medicare beneficiary, want to get care with Dr. Brewer, uh, go out, go to a website, call us, 859-721-1414. Uh, there's, there's kind of a journey to go through regarding paperwork that needs to fill out to comply with Medicare standards, but uh, this is a very good way to get care with Dr. Brewer and get Medicare uh, to pay for it. Uh, if you're not on age to be on Medicare and you are or you are on Medicare Advantage, which we're not accepting right now, we're looking forward to accept it. Uh, but the team is growing rapidly because we have are having such a demand of, on care from Dr. Brewer and the team. Uh, uh, we're, we're confident we're going to get there at some moment. You will know uh, if you don't have traditional Medicare and and you, you can go ahead and go to the website and. Get to know our packages for the direct pay section. Just book an appointment, fill out a short form, and that's gonna 
that's going to leave you to the options and uh, you can decide uh, one of what, which one of those fits for your needs. So that is prepmedhealth.com, book an appointment with Dr. Brewer and the team. Um, we have, uh, uh, Dr. Brewer has hired a couple of nurses and they're on training right now with him, uh, supervised and direct training to understand the way that Dr. Brewer and PrepMed does prevention, preventive medicine. So that's a good opportunity if you want a more specific advice for your own case. Um, I'm jumping from that last slide. That's that's one thing that we covered last week. If you are in, if you have a in, special interest on glycemic index, go ahead and visit our uh, YouTube live from last week. Um, so short form for today, uh, NAD and glaucoma. So this is an article that is posted or published on Redox Biology 2021. And the title is Nicotinamide Provides Neuroprotection in Glaucoma by Protecting Against Mitochondrial and Meta uh, Metabolic Dysfunction. So uh, when you talk about glaucoma, uh, glaucoma is basically high blood pressure on your eyeballs. That, uh, that, or that, that increased pressure that can be both from arteries or the liquid within the eyes create an increased pressure that goes to the back and presses versus the retina, which is the nervous part of the eye that provides the interpretation from convert, transforming light into an uh, um, neurocognitive signaling type of thing, kind of making the light to be transformed into information to the brain. So whenever you are pushing to that retina because of the high pressure that you have on your eye, that's gonna leave an impact. And nerves, as we know, don't have the same ability as other cells to uh, recover. Neurons don't have that opportunity. So what this uh, group of researchers did, they were uh, measuring the impact of one specific supplement called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, NAD, which is an essential redox cofactor and, metabol and metabolite. Um, redox is basically, Dr. Brewer has covered this in the past, and I think we discussed that last week as well. Redox is this chemical process that is the opposite to oxidation. And it, it provides kind of protection to any cell that is going through that process. So the, 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 the theoretical component of this is that NAD can improve cell metabolism by improving both mitochondrial function and volume. So you will have more mitochondria working on, uh, creating more energy, and it provides other benefits on a cellular level. So the researchers tested 1.5 grams to three grams of NAD to improve glaucoma progression. What they, found, what they found is that in rodent models, NAD showed to provide neuroprotective effects increasing mitochondrial size, motility, function, and preventing metabolic stress, meaning reducing oxidation. So what the picture that you see bottom right uh, is basically a microscopic uh, picture of the cell, the cell within the retina of this uh, mice. And just those highlighted roads that you see is just increased mitochondrial functioning. And it's interesting just because, of course, NAD is nowhere near ready to say this supplement is going to improve your glaucoma. But the thing is, they're finding out how NAD supplementation does provide benefits on a mitochondrial level for both vessels and even nerves. So when you look at the the image, it says that you've got the control on the left. You've clearly got increased uh activity on the right, but it's labeled NAM. Uh, I'm assuming nicotinamide adenine mononucleotide as opposed to dinucleotide. Any yep. comments about that? Um, not sure if they compared both of them, uh, but what I'm, what I'm guessing on, on that perspective is that NAD has been metabolized as NAM. Yeah, okay. That's what I would assume, but interesting. So it's, uh, it's preliminary results. Of course, we need more research on this field of supplementation, especially when you're talking about mitochondrial function. Um, 
the impact that you will see, of course, is not, I don't think it's as big as some medications, uh, but it's getting somewhere. And the other thing is not to confuse NAD with NR, nicotinamide riboside, as we covered that a, a few months back, nicotinamide riboside, which is a fairly popular supplement as well, has been found to increase the risk of breast cancer and metastasis, or meaning the sp spread of other types of cancer. So just be aware of that. So and can I take us down a bunny hole to maybe connect a few dots? Sure. Uh, number one, mitochondria. Um, and number two, these different nicotinamide uh, are niacin related products. Nicotinamide is a niacin related product. NMN uh, is a um, niacin related product. Um, David Sinclair has spent a huge portion of his career looking for something, and most of these items are related to niacin, to improve mitochondrial function. And what has mitochondria got to do with it? And it, again, it gets back to oxidation and reduction. Oxidation is also the same thing as burning. It's adding a, an oxygen to the molecule. So you've got a carbon, you add oxygen and you get carbon dioxide or two, two oxygens and you get carbon dioxide. Now uh, that's what our body does and we pull energy out of it. If you compare us to far more um, uh, primitive uh, creatures, their metabolism like a yeast Yeast that makes alcohol, for example, is an, an, what we call an anaerobic, meaning no oxygen involved or very little oxygen involved. It pulls maybe six um, energy units out of a glucose molecule. Uh, humans, on the other hand, and mammals, um, most animals pull... Um, can pull 36 units out of there. And it's because we take many more, we, we use oxygen. That's what um, hemoglobin is all about. It's a protein that carries that ox th that uh, iron um, ion, and iron is able to carry oxygen. So uh, we get huge, we get a multiple, six times the amount of energy out of fuel than more primitive creatures. But, you know, it's just like everything else in life. Our, you know, your, your strengths also create your weaknesses. So on, a, um, on an aging basis, there are several other things that create aging, several other mechanisms. David uh, Sinclair also wrote a great book called Lifespan, which talks about many other types, DNA, information, etc. But for the past, what, 70 years, the reigning um, theory and mechanism about aging has to do with the mitochondria. It's called the mitochondrial theory. And the mitochondria are like the, um, the furnaces in the cell. If you look at heart cells, which are contracting all the time, you may get hundreds, even thousands of mitochondria in a heart cell. But you look at a bone cell, which is relatively inert, you, you get less than a dozen mitochondria in that cell just because it's not needing to burn as much fuel. Another uh, dot to connect on this is uh, you, you talk about uh, poor methylators. In the human body, we don't exactly... Uh, we don't do reduction in oxidation exactly the same as they do in high school chemistry. In high school chemistry, you're adding oxygen to, for oxidation and you're adding hydrogen for uh, reduction. In, a, in the human body, we add a full methyl group. And a methyl group is simply a carbon with four hydrogens on it. Um, how do we do that? Um, we use, we have methyl groups and they're pooled and we hold that pool in our uh, vitamin B1, uh, in our B1 vitamins. So <clears throat> those of us like myself uh, that genetically don't have the best methylation 
uh, uh, DNA. And uh, there's over half of us don't have the best. And there's a couple of MTHFR, methylene tetrahydrofolate, um, reductase, um, genetic variations. We simply uh, take vitamin B, methylated by vitamin B1. So again, a couple of different bunny holes, but hopefully those bunny holes help people connect the general topic that you're talking about with redox and NAD and mitochondria. Definitely. And as you see, uh, when you talk about NM NMN, I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about N NR just because of the reasons we, we discussed with the cancer thing. But NMN is a precursor for NAD. So uh, that all of them impact the, at the same level, basically. And yep, I think that's, 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 that's basically what we wanted to share with this type of uh, slide. We know supplements is a big deal. And you don't see many places when you're, where you're discussing these types of stuff. All right, so I think we're ready to go to the long form content. So um, Gilbert, if you can give us a water bowl. Right, so high triglycerides and plaque uh, rebels are using supplements. Uh, this is a very a specific article. We know we have our favorites on regards to plaque reversal and supplements, and we lived kind of uh, hanging on the expectation of which supplement is this they're going to be talking about. And I'm sorry to disappoint people if you're thinking about K2, which is one of the most popular. This time it's not an article from K2. Uh, I'm confident we can cover K2 again. I have a couple of articles from K2 that we can discuss down the line. This is another one. But first, I want to present you a case or present you to a, a situation that you don't see that often either. And this is for folks who have persistently high triglycerides. You have tried one, two, three separate different drugs, exercise, diet, and your triglycerides are still up on the roof. Uh, there's, there's one thing we have talked about familial hypercholesterolemia. Well, there's one thing that is called familial hypertriglyceridemia. So these folks might be, uh, having this specific issue. This study was presented on the European Society of Cardiology 2022. This is a research from Japan. And the article is, is, uh, named remarkable regression of diffuse coronary atherosclerosis, meaning plaque in patients with triglyceride deposit cardiomyovasculopathy. That's just a complex work to say they have triglyceride on their arterial coronary uh, vessels in the heart. So in this condition called triglyceride deposit cardiomyovasculopathy, but they're basically saying this, these folks have so high triglyceride levels that they're getting deposits from it within the inner uh, the intima of the intima layer or the arterial walls on the on the heart, and they're so, seeing. Yeah, go ahead, Doc. So let's go back to the term cardiomyovasculopathy. So, apathy means uh, damage or disease. Cardio means heart. So we're talking about heart disease. Myo means muscle, and vasculo means vessel. Now, to me, it's still raising the question, are they talking about the vessels or the muscle, or are they talking about the media layer of the vessel, which is, you know, you've got the intima layer, which is the lining, and then you've got the media layer, which holds the artery, uh, holds the line, provides support to the lining. Is it clear in the article? No, uh, the article is uh, fairly short on that side, um, but it doesn't have the specifics on which type of the lining it is. 
I, I from from reading the article, you can see that it's basically the same kind of mechanism as in traditional uh, plaque formation uh, below the intima layer. Okay. Yeah. And and to clarify for uh, most viewers, and a lot of viewers are not going to understand this, plaque actually is a deposit of oxidized LDL underneath the lining, the intima layer, and on top uh, or between the intima layer and the media layer. Yep. And also to remember, um, these folks who have this specific disease, they, they have a genetic mutation that is predisposing them to, do, to have this. So keep that in mind. So just a couple of other points. Um, so this is a genetic uh, hypertriglyceridemia. Yeah. And for uh, those are not, that are not aware, there are what? At least a dozen of those. Mm -hmm. um, if you look them up, they're like six, five or six that are the most prevalent. And um, if you don't have one of those genetic reasons for hypertriglyceridemia, by far the most common reason for having high triglycerides is that you've got insulin, basal insulin that's too high for too long, and insulin stops your body from burning fats. So you just, your triglycerides continue to rise. And so when we see a patient with elevated triglycerides, the next thing we look for is decreased HDL. That combination is classic with what's called metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance or diabetes. And that's why you look at that triglyceride over HDL ratio. Um, if you look that up on the internet, they'll usually say if, it's, if your triglyceride over HDL ratio is two or less, you're, you're fine. The bottom line is it's better to be one. Um, two is better than four. Right? And <clears throat> we had a, a patient and friend uh, come on and give us a couple of videos. He was actually a, uh, a patient of one of the big uh, plant-based dieters, um, Esselstein, who, and he said, Esselstein kept saying, look, you need to decrease your oils. You need to decrease nut consumption. You need to. So what he was doing was getting him completely on carbs and protein. Uh, he lost 50 pounds. Usually that kind of weight loss is going to protect you from an event, but not everybody. Um, his name was Chuck. Um, is it, do you remember his last name? Was it, was it Smith? I don't remember. Uh, he was the fellow that had the, the, so he lost the 50 pounds and then he had a heart attack. Oh, no, 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 no. He was also, uh, his, his video was the only action video we've had. He uh, had his heart attack and he was letting his Tesla drive. Tesla, him. yeah. Uh, I know who you're talking about. I don't remember the last name. Yeah, I'll I'll see if I can look it up. We need to we need to link it to this uh, to this video. But it it makes a couple of points. One of them is that if you've seen one person's metabolism, you've seen one person's metabolism. Most people, if they uh, lose fifty pounds, that in and of itself is going to protect them from a heart attack. But not everybody. So folks like Caldwell Esselstein and the others that are just really into low fat diet. Have, clearly, there's no question, they have saved thousands or tens of thousands of people, but not everybody. And somebody who's got a, a metabolism like Chuck's, you need to be very much aware whether or not they can metabolize carbs. Chuck could not. And uh, when you listen to some, you know, it's often plant-based folks, it's clearly low-fat diet folks, and uh, it works for a lot of people, but you got to know, you got to know the individual's metabolism. And then when you get, get to this group of people, the folks that have a genetic hypertriglyceridemia, there's a whole new set of issues you have to worry about. And with these folks, quite often dropping carbs is not going to, not going to be the only fix that they need. Definitely. 
it's Chuck Smith. You were right. Chuck Smith, yeah. Yeah. So uh, there, there's a video from Dr. Brewer. Chuck's heart attack at 55 miles per hour switch to Tesla autopilot. Uh, it's a really, really good video for you to look at. It's kind of a conference, one hour conference, but it's really, really good stuff. If and we did we did several shorts on it. If you don't have a full hour to watch it, uh, we should be able to find even the some seven minute versions and a couple of one minute versions too. Sure, definitely. So that's that's kind of the idea. So if after that introduction to this disease, you're saying, eh, "Well, I don't think I have that. I don't think this is gonna this is gonna suit to my specific case." I'll say think twice because even with a genetic predisposition, the the, the 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 mechanism of the disease and how plaque is going to cause a heart attack and how that plaque is going to come to be is basically the same thing. These folks only have a genetic predisposition to have a higher risk because of their high triglycerides and they need to do an extra effort to avoid having a heart attack. But the mechanisms underlying it are basically the same. Um, what's ha what, what happens with this uh, disease? There is a diffuse narrowing of the arterial plaque with triglyceride deposits for defective lipolysis, meaning fat destruction. And you're not seeing this fat getting metabolized and it's getting accumulated within the artery wall. Uh, it is usually present in patients with persistent high triglycerides and diabetes as an additional risk factor and can be associated with angina, this chest pain that can or may, may or may not relief after resting or can increase with exercise or physical efforts. And that usually comes when you're having an angina episode, that means two things. Either you're having your vessels getting, getting uh, constrained or getting the flow reduced. There's, there's one thing that is called an Prince metal angina, which is basically a contraction of the artery and can be confused with a heart attack and can cause a heart attack. And the other one is uh, plaque. So if you have, you're building enough plaque to cause an obstruction of the artery, you might have these episodes of chest pain. Um, this, is, this is the supplement that we were gonna talk about today and the research used for this specific uh, publication. Tricaprin is a triglyceride obtained from a plant called Umbellularia californica. Easy it's for an, you to say. Yeah, uh, I, I was born with a Latin accent, right? <laughs> and <laughs> it's an orally available precursor of decanoid acid, which is supposed to have a potential anti-androgen and anti-hyperglycemic properties. Now, how much of that anti-androgen and anti-hyperglycemic effects play a role in here? That's something that we still need to look for. Uh, you might you might you might be aware as a as a viewer uh males have an increased risk of heart attack versus women uh when women are still on their uh um b before menopause once once women reach the menopause and after menopause they might increase their own cardiovascular risk so if you see the data of males before 40s or 45 who have a heart attack, it's way, way more than women that have a heart attack before 45 years old. So that anti-androgen effect might play a role in here. Um, what they did is they had just two subjects. So this is a really, really small study. They only, they, they only had two subjects and they tested the impact of supplementing 1.5 on one of them and 4.5 grams on the other one of tricaprin and two patients with diagnosed uh, tri high triglyceride uh, cardiomyovasculopathy. They monitored symptoms, lipid panel and plaque using a CT angiogram for up to nine months. And if you see on the table right there next to you, they, they're measuring that on, mil on millimoles, but if you can highlight, there are two things that they saw uh, the patient had a decrease on. They had a decrease on LDL. They didn't have so much change on HDL. They have a significant decrease on triglycerides and they didn't see so much of a change on A1C. Now, at 
if you see that right now and you say, okay, if these folks had a plaque reduction and LDL and triglycerides had re decreased, so that, that has something to do with that, right? Uh, I, we will assume that. Well, uh, the researchers had another opinion on that. Patients saw an improvement in symptoms just after three months of supplementation. There was a decrease in the amount of plaque detected on the uh, CTA. And it is believed that this decrease was independent of the lipid panel. So the one thing that I will say about this study, and this is, these are the images that they saw on the CT angiogram and the volume of plaque, the millimeters within the plaque on the heart that they measured before and after the supplementation. Uh, I think it's a good idea for a long-term article, uh, for a long-term intervention, not only on people with this specific rare disease, uh, but unfortunately, they didn't make the, enough statistical uh, procedures to take into account diet, exercise, and other factors, right? It's hard to measure the impact of one supplement alone. Um, but uh, if they are thinking that the lipids did not have too much to do with the impact on plaque, the question remains on what happens with cardiovascular inflammation. And if you can have one of these type of uh, research measuring the effect of these types of supplements on inflammation and on plaque. But it's inter interesting stuff and puts tricaprine on the map as one of those supplements to keep an eye on for the next years. Hmm. So uh, basically they're saying tricoprene helped, op helped decrease triglyceride related plaque. Yeah. And they measure, they measure it with a CTA, which is, which is more reliable than just doing Framingham and other stuff, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. It's a very, very small uh, sample of people, just two folks. But, well, uh, it, it's, it's good enough to bring the discussion about this. Yeah. It's clearly what we would call a signal. Yep. It's not conclusive at all, but there's a signal there. And, and I can understand why the pool of patients is just so low. You don't see this type yeah. of uh, disease so often. So that you don't see that disease very often. There's a lot of work involved, a lot of expense doing these doing these things. Yep. So it's almost like a pilot. Yep. Uh, yeah, exactly right. Yes. Well, very that's, interesting. That's the long form from today. Anything to add, Dr. Brewer? No, it's like I see we've got a lot of a lot of viewers. We always get a lot of viewers whenever we talk about supplements. And, you know, it's an interesting thing. When I first got into uh, what, five, six years ago, when I started presenting stuff um, here for free on YouTube, it was I was one of those uh, docs that felt like supplements were, for the most part, expensive urine. Um, and I had not really looked. And one of the things that I wanted to do was apply some of those um, epidemiology skills that I learned at Hopkins to the real, um, the real evidence behind supplements as well as many other things. And I was surprised as I began to look at the evidence that there's more positive real evidence behind supplements than many of us think. Um, so there you go. And they're being research. I mean, it's just that a lot of that research is not, first, it's not, it's, uh, uh, again, with the conspiracy hats, a lot of that research is not being funded by pharma. Yeah. So, it's, so it's not as popular. Uh, but it's always good to have this type of research because I, I, it, I, I, don't, I don't think they have some kind of external funding. I'm, I'm seeing that right now in the article. There are some grants that they had from their own, um, their own health 
ministry on Japan, stuff like that, or just some private companies, maybe the ones that create the supplements, more, more the supplement industry than the pharma industry. Uh, but it's, if, you are, if you're dealing with a supplement, it's always good to make your own research and find out and go to places like this to have discussions about supplements that you don't see very often and make an informed decision whether taking a supplement or not. We discussed, there's, we covered that a few weeks back and I can bring that, bring that short back. Um, a discussion about a senator, a senator's wife that just died after ingesting some type of supplement. Do you remember which one it was? Which supplement? Uh, it was a plant-based supplement. I, don't, I, I might have it right here uh, on my notes. That was a few months ago. Yeah. Yes, I mean, it happened recently. You can, um, you can die taking supplements. And the, the two most, and there seems there's a correlation to the supplements that are most powerful uh, can cut both ways. Uh, niacin and vitamin D3 are two of the most powerful supplements that we use we, and two of the most common recommendations that we have in terms of supplementation. And both of those have killed people. Uh, vitamin D3 from overdose and niacin from um, l liver injury, uh, vitamin D3 from kidney injury. And again, uh, niacin or B is in boy three from uh, liver injury. It was white mulberry leaf. White mulberry leaf. Yeah. And uh, let me, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I have the name of the senator, but you can, you can, oh, here it is. Tom McClintock. McClintock. Tom McClintock. McClintock. Yeah. yeah. What is it in and, white mulberry leaf? Is it one of those things like, um, um, is it an adrenaline based thing? Um, it says amino sugar alkaloids, so we might we might we might want to cover that later on and talk. We can we can recover that short and add up some more stuff about white mulberry leaf. So if you're taking white mulberry leaf, just think twice. Be careful. <laughs> make, a, make a review about it. Yeah, be careful. Uh, some plants. A lot of people discuss and say plants are safe. Everything that is natural is going to be safe. Well. Uh, Digoxin? Did you, how did you pronounce that? Digoxin? Digoxin? Oh, digoxin, D-I-G-O-X-I-N. Well, that's that comes from a plant that is called di digital or di digital. Yeah, digitalis, and that and can that, kill you as well. Yeah, and that plant, I mean, it, it's it's a plant. It it should be safe, right? Well, we use that as an antiarrhythmic uh, drug, and it, it can cause arrhythmias. On people who don't need it so maybe natural is not as safe as you think and i'm not gonna say that company that i mentioned last week just because i don't know if the last video got demonetized demonetized i don't want this happening <laughs> with this video but there there's there are a lot of uh supplements sent, selling um shakes and stuff like that that they claim are natural and you put the powder over there and it's gonna decrease your blood sugar and anything and they're mostly re uh, have been related to kidney disease. So be careful with the stuff that you that you take. Uh, just to remind you, I just checked, did a quick check on it. Uh, white mulberry is Morris alba. It's a tree native to China. White colored fruit, similar to a blackberry, but with an unpleasant taste. And it's used for type two diabetes to slow the breakdown of sugar in the stomach so that it's absorbed more slowly. So that's, it's also used for high cholesterol levels and high blood pressure. So that's clearly um, the type of supplement that our viewers might be interested in. Yeah. And that's what killed um, Tom McClintock's wife, right? Yep. H have, you, have you heard about Moringa? I've heard the name. It's, it's ringing a bell, but I'm not sure why. Very popular in Latin America. Uh, they claim it's for diabetes. I've seen plenty of people dropping their medication to start doing that. And it's related mm. to kidney disease, as you may expect. So, mm. and it's just the, the branding and something gets popular and just, just be aware and be careful of supplements as well. Not as regulated as meds. 
we are very worried about side effects from meds when meds are being monitored more closely than a lot of supplements and you might have an impact on it and not noticing. When you say meds, you mean prescription medications. Prescription medications, yeah. Yeah, which are different in the U.S. versus Mexico. <clears throat> you can get a lot of stuff over the counter in Mexico. And oh, a, a, a lot of stuff. Yeah, medications in Mexico only. You, you need prescriptions for antibiotics and controlled substances such antidepressants, some antidepressants, and some pain medication. But you can get a lot of antibiotics over the counter, right? Uh, no, antibiotics, no. Uh, but a lot of antidepressants you can have oh, really? on the counter. Yeah. Um, so just the, the more controlled ones, they're called group four and five. Uh, some of, some are specific names, and I don't have them on my mind right now, but they're very, very controlled. But you can have metformin without, prescription, without a prescription. You can get statins mm -hmm. without a prescription. You can get a Sempic without a prescription. Wow. You can get a, a CGM without a prescription. So uh, I, I'm, I'm going to say something. Uh, please don't hate on me. U.S. is a great U.S. The U.S. is a great country. I've been there. I loved it, but I love love living in Mexico for a lot of for a lot a lot of things uh, yeah. related to health. No question. So, yeah. Well, the items that you bring up, especially metformin, I think metformin should be over the counter. Yep. Yeah, it's um, it's very interesting to see the phenomenon happening right here and. It, it, and the, the bad thing is on diabetes, on care of diabetes, I, I shared this with you, I think last week, I had a discussion with a person that is doing a lot of stuff on diabetes prevention. And they have so different, so clearly different ideas between you and I. Uh, there, there are medications right here that are called sulfonylureas. You might be familiar with those. So um, and we, we, we would usually pronounce it sulfonylurea. Okay. <clears throat> sulfonylureas. And... That's um, there's one one that is called I don't think you have that on the U.S. Glibenclamida, glibenclamide. You have glimepiride, but glibenclamide yeah. I, I don't think has been approved by the FDA because it causes a lot of uh, a lot of events of hypoglycemia. Right. And they prescribe it here as if it's candy. Water. Well, it used to be the glimepirides and uh, uh, used to be, unless I'm mistaken, aren't those the one that used to be, or the sulfonylureas used to be very common here? I, 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 I bet they were. Yeah, yes. I bet they were. But there's very a high risk of hypoglycemia. I'm sorry? But, but very inexpensive, but, uh, but a very high risk of hypoglycemia. Yeah. And uh, you'll still, I mean, we've, we'll, every now and then we'll get a patient that comes to us that's still on a uh, sulfonylurea. Yeah. But, but, but the point is, the, the point I'm making is, even on sulfonylurea, there's one that you're not using anymore because of the risk. And it's over the counter over here. Yeah. So, Which one? Uh, Gleben Club. It might be glibenclamide on, on, on English. Mm. Glibenclamida in Spanish. How do you spell it? Um, G L might be with a Y for you. G L Y B E N C L A M I D E. This turned out into a spelling contest. You're putting me on the spot. Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sometimes yeah. with an I, sometimes with an E. And huh, very interesting. Yeah. So we are we're in the different we're in the different place in regards to diabetes treatment. And when I brought up some of the stuff that we do, they were like, Oh, we already do prevention. We don't need anything else. I'm like, okay, that's okay. Um just trying to see if we can do something over here. Oh wait a minute, gliburide? No, it's I don't know if this is a different name, but we don't have gliburide over here. Gl uh, well, gl gl glibenclamide is also known as gliburide. Hmm, that might be the case this. now. Yeah. And then gliburide, I've seen a lot. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. And there's a there's a significant debate about getting rid of it again for the reasons that you discussed. It's uh, hypoglycemic episodes are dangerous. But that, that's a debate. Got, 
That's a, debate on the U- that's a debate on the U.S., not over here. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've got uh, metformin is by far the most common first line prescription drug. And as you and I have said, many of us, myself included, would say metformin is really safe enough to not to not require FDA or, or not require a prescription. The assumption is that uh, metformin creates uh, risk for, quote, formic acid or met, uh, a metabolic acidosis. And there have been not one, but two different studies, uh, Cochrane analyses. Cochrane is the group that does the, the meta-analyses, um, the review of the world's literature in something, and they found metformin safe in that area. If you have... Um, if you have uh, full-blown or significant kidney failure, yeah, there's probably, I don't recommend it. And there's black box, war- black box warnings for that. But as safe as metformin is, it still has a little bit more uh, risk for uh, hypoglycemia than the newer drugs. Uh, the uh, STLT2s and the GLPs, like uh, Ozempic. The problem is the newer drugs are just prohibitively expensive, 750 to 1,000 per month. Unless you go to Mexico and you can get, in Mexico you can get Ozempic for, what'd you say, 300 a month? Uh, let me turn, let me, let me, I'm, I'm so bad at math. Let me give you the numbers on your currency. $88? Eighty-eight dollars. So we've got we've got a lot of patients that do go uh, to Canada or Mexico for medications. So eighty-eight to one hundred and fifty dollars. I mean, way way cheaper. I, I think I I believe even a CGM might be more expensive than Nosempic. Wow! Amazing. Mm-hmm. So Very I, interesting. Same thing with insulin. Well, insulin is expensive in Mexico, but if you're coming with dollars, it might not be. Well, the place where the dollar, the dollar is right now, a little bit more expensive than maybe a few months back, but still way cheaper yeah. than in the U.S. Yeah. Well, anything else before we go to the Q&A? Well, I, I, I think that's, that's enough chatting for, for, <laughs> <laughs> for drifting from prog- plaque reversal to anti diabetic drugs. Thank you so much for your patience with us. So if you'll give us the, the transition, Gilbert, we'll go into Q&A. So, Jesus, you're in control again. Well, once a week. Uh, uh, Rita, Rita Palazzo uh, just became a YouTube member. Thank you so much. And Greg Scaffy became a YouTube member as well. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, the, the, the thing that we try to do with that is, and, and Gilbert is showing right there how you can become a member. It's just a couple of months a month. Uh, and uh, the idea behind that is we are almost never able to see all the questions that you put on the chat. So what we said was, okay, let's, let's, let's create an additional value for, for those who are YouTube members. You are not only helping Dr. Brewer on his mission to provide this life-saving information all over the world. Uh, you are also going to get a chance to have your question read before others. So you don't have to either, you, you will have to either place it at the beginning when the show is starting, or if you are a YouTube member, you might be able to have your question read uh, before. So uh, thank you so much for th- those who are becoming a YouTube members and those who are just viewing the channel. Thank you so much as well. So um, Dr. Brewer, you did answer to them and I wanna address the first comments that you answered to. Uh, you did say thanks to Rita and I'm, I'm, I'm skipping the line a little bit. Judy Petrowski, thank you for helping others. God bless and you did answer this. Will it be better if you were good at golfing? Uh, it might be a little bit more of a challenge, but I don't think so. I mean, it's, <laughs> as you know, you're you're there with us. We get all these patients that, with, with the as as we're starting to accept insurance now, we, we're getting so many more new patients, and they're coming in and they're saying, "Gosh, you know, 
uh, you saved our, you're saving lives before you even become a patient. And that's the whole idea behind the channel. And we had Clean Slate on the channel a few weeks back, who is a viewer as well. And he shared his story with us. Even he was not a patient from Dr. Brewer. He had a significant weight loss. He He's seeing an uh, establishment on, establishment on his plaque. He shared his CIMT results with us. And uh, that's, that's the kind of stories that you see from just viewers, not even patients. So that's really good. Um, thank you for joining, Greg, of course. And my pleasure. Thank you for all the education. Thank you for listening. And, and I can tell you, we have very, a very educated audience. And oh, we, yeah. have, we have shared stuff that they have sent us to the email, articles that they have seen. They have brought up discussions and questions that are really good to cover. And, and we appreciate that. that. That's what makes this type of shows very, very rich on regards to information. Peter, you know, we're, we're bringing on new providers. And, uh, and we had actually one of them, uh, Jeannie, come on the show recently. And we'll have uh, Heather come on as she gets a little bit more trained. Um, and it's intimidating because our typical patient knows more about this space than what? 90, 95% of trained medical doctors out there. Definitely. Yeah. And sometimes they come with, hey, I, I, read, I read this about this X supplement. And it, it takes us to, to research on that supplement. And uh, that's really good. I mean, it, it, this, this is part of what we do. There's just so much information out there. It's hard to keep up on with those. And we try to use the one that is really useful on the clinical practice and the ones that you might be interested in. Rick Folia, good morning from Atlanta. Good morning, Rick. Uh, Melissa, who is one of those people who become a YouTube member from the very beginning. We appreciate that, of course. Uh, and if you see a lot of comments from Melissa, if you see a lot of comments from Rick, just, just became a YouTube member. You, you can be there. <laughs> Melissa, since I have had an, an MI, a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, my cardiologist wants me my LDL below 70, which requires me to take 20 milligrams of Crestor. Oh, you definitely have thoughts on this one. I do. Well, the first I, thought is <laughs> I'm going to take that as an invitation, as you as you guessed. So the first thought is obviously we can't practice medicine. We we do have. I'm trying. How many how many folks do you think we have on 20 milligrams of Crestor? Any? Maybe maybe less than 5%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe one or two. Um, so we don't tend to use those larger amounts. Uh, well, the first thing is we can't practice medicine on somebody. Um, so we don't know what your case is. We'd have to become your doctor to advise you. And becoming your doctor, creating that doctor-patient relationship involves learning all of the other stuff, you know, what your blood pressure is, what you, what your reactions may have been to statins and other medications in the past, what level of insulin resistance, prediabetes you have, blood pressure, all these things. Um, <clears throat> but we tend to not use, uh, but we can talk about specific issues. And the specific issue that you're bringing up is, number one, how, how often do we use these mid to high dose statins? Or, or even number one, do we use statins? As Jesus mentioned before, we do use statins. Um, but uh, some doctors would say 20 milligrams of Crestor or Resuvastatin is a high dose, is a medium dose. We would say high dose. It's more equivalent to 40 milligrams of uh, Lipitor. Uh, we don't use Lipitor at all. I think we've had one patient over the past few years that we used Lipitor and it was the patient preferred it. They were used to it. They had tried several others and just did not like it. So we said, you know what? You're the captain of your ship. We'll write that script for you. We don't use it. But again, we don't, cons we, we, another thing is we don't have a paternalistic practice. If something is reasonable and within appropriate standards, clearly we will help you get what you need to be uh, or get where you need to be. And you're the captain, not us. We're your uh, uh, consultant. The, um, uh, the next thing is, do we use statins at all? Yes, we do recommend statins, but not quite so much for LDL. LDL levels do matter, but 
in our experience, they look like they're more of a bio indicator, meaning uh, <clears throat> most of the rest of the medical world has classically interpreted high LDL. So, so you see a correlation. You get into this discussion of correlation versus causation. And there's no question there's a correlation between high LDL. LDLs, in your case, with your cardiologist talking about it, at this point in time, yeah, they're even seeing a correlation between uh, LDLs over 70 and heart disease, especially in people that have a constellation of other things. And that's what we have tended to focus on. What constellation are we talking about? Because in people that have a triglyceride over HDL of less than one, for example, an LDL of 130 is not an issue. And in fact, in some cases, as you begin to look at it, some of those people have lean mass hyperresponder status and they get these LDLs a couple of hundred or higher. That is currently under significant debate over whether that's really bad or if it's just a genetic variation of a metabolic uh, energy uh, transfer. In other words, a healthy state, not an unhealthy state. So there is so much more to just to just looking at your LDL and trying to say, okay, is that a risk or not? So again, that also helps explain why uh, we can't practice medicine over the internet, but we can give you some of our thoughts. Um, what do we, t when we do use um, uh, a statin, when do we use it? And not because of uh, an LDL level. Uh, we do use it for plaque. Once you've gotten plaque, you've, the term that we use is you've crossed that Rubicon. Um, for those of you who haven't he heard that term, that's a, that's a historical term. When Caesar crossed a river called the Rubicon, he was declared as being a traitor to the then existing state of uh, 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 government of Rome, and he couldn't go back. And that's the issue here. Once you form plaque, you can't go back. So you are now, once you form plaque, you are a cardiovascular patient. Well, Melissa, if you've had an MI, you clearly had plaque and you're a cardiovascular patient. So yes, we would recommend statins. It's not quite so much though, even still then, that we look at a, an LDL level. Uh, we look at all these other things. We focus much more on those than we do LDL levels. Uh, when we do use statins, Crestor and Patavastatin or, or uh, Lavalo and Crestor, the generic name is Resuvastatin. We do use those. Those are by far our two most commonly used ones. I used to use a lot of Simvastatin, um, Pravastatin. Those were good meds. But with those statins, you had to look for a thing called um, KIF-6, which is a genetic variation which impacts how your body metabolizes statins. Hey, Sus, you shouldn't have given me the floor. I just took off. So, <laughs> No, I, I, it's, it's, it's core to our content, to, to our audience, because this is far more common than you might think. We have a lot of patients that come in and say, hey, this, I, I, I have an LDL of 130, and my cardiologist want me, to, want me on 40 milligrams of, of Lipitor, right? And yeah. The other thing you have to be aware of, these high doses of statins put you on increased risk of side effects. Mm. We have discussed on multiple occasions the muscle pain and fatigue and other stuff, but also uh, insulin resistance. So yeah. they're, they're get, if you're on high dose of statins, you're on a higher risk to be driven to that uh, place of developing plaque just because of insulin resistance. And we're, we're very much more worried about insulin resistance than we are for LDL. So there you go. Uh, a lot more. But given what we do, use of statins is a really big deal. And LDL levels is a really big deal. So you want to know our immediate thoughts? That was some of them. 
<laughs> uh, that's not going to be useful for a short video, but that's okay. <laughs> now we, we, we have two, three minutes video, so that, that's what we use. Uh, Jay Pitard, on the subject of supplements, does Gymnema tea break a fast? I don't think so, but I'm not taking Gymnema, are you? Uh, I don't uh, think it breaks a fast either. It's sort of like a tea. It does any other tea, like a black tea or a green tea, do those break a fast? Not unless you have milk or sugar in them. And I think it's the same thing with Jim Nima. I looked it up uh, to check it out. And all I saw was what I would have expected to see. And that was, uh, no, it actually lowers blood glucose. So, um, I don't think so. I still don't think so. I think you're right. And I'm 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 jumping a little bit on Carol Adams just because it says uh, uh, happy birthday. I need a good cardiologist in the Atlanta area that has the mindset that Dr. Brewer has. Can you recommend one until we have you have connection in Atlanta? So just so you know, uh, Dr. Brewer is not a cardiologist, but I can tell you he does way more work on preventive medicine on this field than a lot of cardiologists. And uh, Dr. Brewer has license in all fifty states. So if, if that's something that you will be interested in, uh, not a cardiologist, but Dr. Brewer, uh, Gilbert, can you put up the phone number up here? 859-721-1414. Call and one of the team members might answer to you and we can set up a um, telemedicine visit for you if you're interested on it. Yeah, you bring up a good point. Let, let me um, uh, make a couple of comments. Number one, why do you need somebody in the Atlanta area? If, and what are you using that cardiologist for? Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, there are just not enough prevention trained doctors. Uh, you get out of 200 um, uh, doctors training through medical school and residency, you get what? Less than 10% going into any of the primary care specialties. And you're lucky to get one trained in prevention. So what happens is most prevention is, is practiced by either primary care docs or docs in the specialty. So <clears throat> most people, uh, and I wonder if Carol is one of them, it's like 98% of people rely on a cardiologist to practice preventive cardiology. Um, and again, uh, use of statins is a prevention decision, not uh, more so than a, uh, a cardiology decision. Cardiologists uh, are guys that they're plumbers. I mean, they do plumbing kind of work. They also do dysrhythmia work. Um, but again, it's more it's a different activity. It's just they're. Is there's so little manpower for prevention that you just don't get prevention specialists that are trained and uh, available to do this work. The second thing I would say is, as Jesus mentioned, we're, um, <clears throat> prevention is not a procedure-oriented uh, specialty. Uh, Cardiology, especially uh, interventional cardiology, is a procedure-oriented specialty. And uh, if you're not procedure-oriented, you're very, very well set up for uh, remote work, telemedicine. And that's exactly what we do. We have patients not only all over the U.S., we have patients uh, all over um, the rest of the world. And um, <clears throat> we're licensed in every state in the U.S. Uh, when you have a patient in, in other parts of the world, it's more of a consultation as opposed to actually we don't write prescriptions in other countries and things like that. They have doctors in other countries. But clearly we're licensed in Georgia um, and uh, we'd be happy to talk to you. <clears throat> I, I have a comment on that. Uh you don't see many TV series of preventive medicine docs, right? <laughs> <laughs> you see surgeons, you see trauma, you see cardiologists. You, you want your Christina Yanks, you want, you want your uh, Derek Shepherds all over the world, but neither, n not one of them do the prevention, right? And uh, <laughs> the, the other thing is, um, 
and uh, this is regards to procedures we we do advocate for stents not being life-saving and we have a lot of patients that are almost due to have a stent for preventive uh, yeah. uh reasons uh we just we, it's not like we're taking taking them out of that idea we provide more information so they can make an informed decision but i can tell you stents can save lives and just like dr brewer i have a lot of experience on emergency medicine i do teach one of those courses about putting a stent on people uh, that is called the advanced cardiovascular life support i just had a course last week about that and we and we and we advocate for stents when they are life-saving when you are having a heart attack that's when they work and that's when you might need a interventionist cardiologist. So could I could I add a little bit more to that? In sure, terms, sure, sure. Uh, in terms of the uh, research, yes, as you mentioned, stents are life saving <clears throat> only in a certain situation when you're actively having a heart attack and they're able to remove the clot using the stenting process. That's uh, when you look at the amount of stents that are put in it's less than 10% of stents. The other 90 plus percent of stents are put in to quote, prevent a heart attack. Now it's not only one study, it's at least three major studies have demonstrated stents do not prevent a heart attack, even though 90% of them are done for that purpose. The original courage trials, the Orbita trials, and then uh, the ischemia trials, all of those trials, world-class research. And you see, uh, you see world-class uh, cardiologists talking about, hmm, I didn't know that that's what was going to happen. And what is, what's going to happen to our whole specialty? It's going to have financial implications because stents tend to finance a lot of hospitals, a lot of clinics, a lot of cardiology practices. So it put cardiologists in a bad position where if I actually only did stents on people where it's been proven to help, you couldn't make your, uh, they couldn't make their house payments. So, you know, it is what it is. And we go to student debt on medicine, which is another whole thing to talk yeah. about. A lot, a lot of uh, physicians go out from school on debt. So you have to pay the bills. Uh, Jay Pitar, does anyone know how to spell lumen for the device? That's lumen. Uh, I'm, I'm the spelling guy right here. So it's L-U-M-E-N. And that's it. I just put it in the comments. L-U-M-E-N. Yeah. Take a look at the website. And yeah, take, you can take your own decisions regarding the, the device. We're, we're very likely to cover that. Uh, in the near future. That may Marisa, have gotten this video de demonetized. You, you keep worrying about it. I appreciate you worrying about it, but. Oh, it should, should I not worry about this video getting demonetized anymore? Uh, probably not. <clears throat> Do not take care of a life. That's all my, <laughs> that's, that's the only thing that I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> Melissa, is small, it's a small dense LDL elevated due to fat consumption, carb consumption, and or genetics. Uh, might be a little bit of all of those, right? There were more, more than more, more carbs and genetics, and yeah. um, and maybe, yeah, maybe, all, maybe all of them. But so, but the, the point remains: it's, it's not so much about LDL. I, we are not that worried about LDL. So you don't like me to mention other um, other YouTubers? Uh, I I get. There, there's a lot of we used to get a lot of crossover with Ivor Cummins. Not so much. He's sort of gone in a we still get a lot of crossover with Ivor's, but he's veered a little bit. Um, we, we get a lot of crossover with uh, Rhonda Patrick. We get a lot of crossover with Peter Atia. The reason I'm bringing this up and a lot of crossover with uh, Boz, Annette Bosworth. <clears throat> each of which I agree with a lot of the stuff they say, but not everything. One of the things that I have agreed with, with Peter Atia is the time that he had uh, Dayspring. I think it's Thomas Dayspring on, uh, a very active, social media active uh, lipidologist. And they had a great show on 
uh, triglyceride and HDL. And what they what, what they were talking about is how w in a failed carb metabolism, especially if you have insulin resistance or even full-blown diabetes and you're eating carbs, and some of us, even when we're not eating carbs, we still struggle in that space. What happens is the particles, whether it's HDL or LDL, the large, fluffy, healthy ones uh, don't carry uh, cholesterol so much anymore. They start carrying fatty acids. When a fatty acid uh, laden uh, particle, cholesterol particle goes through the liver, it's metabolized. So what happens is you lose the large, fluffy LDL and the large, fluffy HDL. And <clears throat> Quest used to provide us the actual bell curves on both of those. If you look it up, you'll see that it's the large, fluffy HDL that are supposed to be effective, the large, fluffy LDL that are supposed to be healthy. And again, you get into that correlation versus causation. Many scientists believe that it's uh, the small, dense LDL that causes the damage. Maybe, maybe not. They believe, many of them believe that it's the large, fluffy HDL that repairs damage. Again, maybe, maybe not, but uh, I think there's a really good case that it's at least, these are at least bioindicators. Um, so one of the most common things we do and usually get great res results from it, when we have a patient that comes on and they have large, uh, they have loss of their large fluffy LDL, large uh, fluffy HDL, they have an elevated triglyceride over HDL, they also, these group, these folks will also have, almost always have, quote, increased small, dense LDL, just like Melissa's talking about. Is small, dense L, uh, LDL elevated due to fat consumption, carb consumption, or genetics? Genetics has an impact, but what we always tell these people to do is cut their carbs and let's see what kind of impact we have. Almost always, you get an improvement in small dense LDL, as well as large fluffy HDL, and that's one of the things that we look for. You know, in that same show, Dayspring was talking about how few doctors actually get a fractionation. The biggest things that we look for on fractionation are large fluffy HDL, and what we call the A pattern versus B pattern. It's, uh, again, an indicator of how much uh, large, fluffy LDL you're retaining. And again, to your question, Melissa, pardon me if I went around the horn to get there. Um, we focus on carb consumption for that issue. Wonderful. Uh, JP Tart saying thanks. And really interesting question from Robert Pinsky right here. How do you choose between taking a GLP-1 versus an SG, SGLT-2? There's a couple of practical things like uh, your insurance and your insurance coverage. There are a couple of other practical things. You know, each one of them has a different uh, side effect profile. Um, <clears throat> if you've had urinary tract problems, uh, the SGLT-2s work on your urinary tract. So... Um, you may that may lean you towards the glip ones. Um, glip ones, for the most part, there are a couple, there are at least one glip ones, and there's going to be some new ones coming out that are you can take by mouth. But the vast majority of the glip ones are injected. That people are getting more and more used to self injection, but some people just can't wrap their head around it. Um, and then one of the final other, couple of final other considerations, glip ones are a little bit more expensive. In your typical um, U.S. insured population, uh, the glip ones are going for about a thousand per month, depending on what your insurance can cover, uh, whether or not they will cover it. Sometimes they'll cover that. Sometimes they'll cover SGLT2s, which uh, are typically costing like seven eight hundred per month. Uh, the final thing about uh, glip ones is um, if you've had problems with um, 
your pancreas in the past, and especially if you've had uh, adenomatous cancers, cancers of the thyroid, cancers, uh, multiple endocrine adenomatosis, M-E-A. Um, cancers in that space, <clears throat> they would recommend not, uh, not taking a GLP-1. The GLP-1s actually cause the pancreas to uh, be able to uh, secrete more insulin. And when you look at some of the, um, the samples of pancreas of people that have taken those, you get some increase in the uh, pancreatic cell structure. So if there's been a cancer in that space, you don't want to encourage it. Yep. Hey, Sus, I just sort of reacted. You, you've been there for a lot of these. Any other thoughts? Um, what I have seen is definitely mostly the insurance thing. But if that's not a problem, uh, because insurance were, are, are going to ask you to have done a lot of metformin, a lot of other type of anti-diabetic drugs before approving any of those two. Um, of course, I think the evidence is showing a little bit more of impact on weight loss on a GLP-1 than in an SGLT2. Oh, yeah, really good point. Thanks. And, Repeat that, please. Yeah, more weight loss with GLP-1s than SGLT2s and more sleep improved, improvement as well with the GLP-1s than SGLT2s. On the, on the efficacy for diabetes, they're pretty similar, but it's just what, what additional uh, benefits are you looking for? And uh, if you are willing to be having an injection, which is not that painful, actually. And uh, of course, the, the safety or the side effects, if you can tolerate them. We have had uh, patients that are experiencing a lot of nausea with lip ones and vomiting. So they are not tolerating it. So it, it, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of why are you taking it and the expected side effects that you might have. Uh, Jerry Wilhelm, I have heard a number of people state that they experience a prohibition taking NMN and I'm not surprised. So, uh, it might have an impact as well on vision acuity, especially if they're having glaucoma or even, well, I'm being bold right here, but I don't know if it might have an impact on diabetic retinopathy. We'll have to look for research on that field. Uh, but at least for a chemical and uh, metabolic point of view, it, 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 it seems like it might work. We have seen a lot of medications and supplements that have promising results on the lab. And then when you test it on people, they're not showing it like, like that. So that's why we're being uh, more um, um, kind of prudent, if that's a word. We're not, we're not saying anybody should be taking an AD just yet. JP Tard, was the NAD dosage 1.5 to 3 grams a realistic dosage for an individual to take daily? Uh, on supplements, you see that a lot, right? Uh, we discussed yeah. TMG. TMG was one of those that you take on grams. Niacin yeah. is one of those that you can take up to 2 grams. So uh, supplements usually have that reasoning behind them. Uh, you might need more of the dose than you might compare with prescription medications. I don't, do you want to add something to that comment, Dr. Brewer? Uh, <clears throat> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's about the safety profile, of course. And uh, of course, uh, the, the, in, the dose of the amount, if you're exceeding that, might take you to the risk of having a, a side effect. Uh, but on medications, you can see that we're talking about how Crestor or Atorvastatin on Doses up to 20 milligrams or 40 milligrams, th those are not grams and it's still an impact. So it's, it's not just about it. it there is something that we call bioequivalence, where one, one thing might just be equivalent to five milligrams to some other thing. Yeah. Just consider that. You see that with uh, magnesium. Mm -hmm. it, it's very uh, different. Picolinate versus three and eight versus uh, some of the other uh, anions. Uh, JP Tar, just thanking thanking Dennis and um, uh, Rick Folia. Carol Adams, I use Doctor Bat at HBC Canto GA. He's not a doctor, as he isn't a doctor Brewer, but.
but he's open-minded and is willing to work with me and my low-carb lifestyle. So that's good to know. And and on medicine, it's also good to have a um, kind of a team approach in some aspects. And Dr. Bro has worked with a lot of cardiologists as well. Uh, and we're, we're cool with that. Rick Folia, hey folks, see the bold names in the chat with a colored asterisk. Those are folks who are members. It's only a couple of bucks a month and really help Dr. Bruno and his team. Please consider joining. Thank you so much, Rick. Uh, Thank Rick you, is, Rick. Yeah, really appreciate it. Also, click the like button. As I said before, click the like button and share the content to folks that you like and that you think are going to be using this information. If you're liking the content, share this with family and friends. If you don't like this content, share it with your enemies. Uh, we're still getting views. <laughs> you know, there's a... There's a couple of video creator content creators that I've seen that really uh, sort of challenge people to hit uh, thumbs down if they don't like their content. <clears throat> and here's what here's why they're doing that. A thumbs down is going to generate a, at least as much uh, AI interest, sometimes even more. And you start to look at uh, what's happened with uh, the world today and the impact of social media, uh, it becomes really clear. And if you understand how news works, it's always bad news that that travels fast. There's really good reasons for it. I was senior management at Toyota. And in that role, we had media training and they started out the media training saying, um, you ever wonder why it's always bad news? It's because humans listen to bad news. It, they, they look at it for uh, a defense purposes. And so good news is not news. So, uh, so yes, if you don't like our content, give us a thumbs down. The algorithm, the AI will read that as, hey, something's going on that these, that's making people <laughs> upset, frustrated, and that will... Uh, that will cause the AI to push it out even further. I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share something that um, it, it's related to this. Something that one of our co-workers, friends of ours, experienced on the phone. A patient that saw you on the YouTube channel, went into the prep and hell, wanted to to get one of the packages, but they thought it was expensive, mm. and they t and they and they said. Uh, um, I thought Dr. Brewer wanted to help people. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is a version of free things to, to provide to people, uh, folks. So uh, seeing the, the content, it's absolutely free. Clicking, yeah. clicking the like button is free. If you went to the website and you, didn't, leak, you don't, didn't like what you saw and you think Dr. Brewer is not doing, doing a good job, click the dislike button. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, John McCoy, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Uh, John, uh, and we have another question from Melissa right here. I heard vitamin E supplementation is safe. It's, it's not safe anymore. I, I guess she was trying to say it isn't safe. Leads to increased cancer. Thoughts? I haven't seen a lot of vitamin E. Uh, not, I haven't, I'm not familiar with research regarding cancer. I can say that I, at least myself, I'm not. Uh, we're not prescribing consistently vitamin E for cardiovascular purposes. Correct. I'll just leave it. Uh, there's a lot of debate about vitamin E right now. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, I'm not uh, going to go I down am. the funny hole right at this point. I will say this while I've uh, interrupted. I'm, I'm going to need to go. I've got a beach out there calling my name. Uh, I'm so and jealous. And... And, and even and even and even with with our uh, project about uh, the YouTube membership, we have a couple of messages right there that haven't been addressed. Uh, we appreciate your patience. Response Digital Media just give us a twenty dollars super chats, and Dr. Bruno needs to go, so uh, we appreciate you staying here. JP Tart, antibiotics are restricted in Mexico because of antibiotic resistance. That's it. <laughs> They're concerned about bacteria getting stronger. That's why. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much for joining today. Hey, sis, if you wanna if you wanna continue on, you feel free. I have tons of work that my boss <laughs> Dr. has left, me. so <laughs> I'm not on the beach yet. I'm not going to be on the beach with the weekend. I'm gonna to do Guanajuato, as we mentioned, beautiful place. I'm waiting for you to calm down 
I'll be happy to give you a tour through the city. I look forward to it. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining today. See you next thank week. Thank you.